When we were filming Twilight, none of us had any idea how big it was going to be. We didn't know how well it was going to do. And it was amazing. I wasn't expecting it, but it's strangely nostalgic because we've all changed a lot. It's been like a whole year. Kind of coming back to like a whole other party, but the same venue. I hadn't really left the kind of Twilight bubble for about two months, and so it's strange. It kind of just feels like a continuation. <laughs> we are having a great time. <laughs> <laughs> As soon as we finished filming Twilight, it was like publicity and touring and all this really cool stuff we got to do up until the movie came out. We are at the famous world premiere of Twilight. I don't think any of us saw it coming, so it was a real crazy journey. Unless you've been living under a rock for the past year and a half, everybody knows what Twilight is, and it's, it's quite extraordinary. I've done a lot of movies, and I've never had the response that I've had with Twilight. I mean, it's very humbling to be in a crowd full of thousands of people cheering and screaming because they're fans of what you do. It's been an amazing journey. We all became kind of a close family, so that's definitely been, been really fun. Twilight gave me a lot of opportunities to walk into a lot of doors that I couldn't have before. It's been incredible. On the one hand, my life is totally the same. Like, I still just hang out at home, only now there's a Twilight world, then your whole life is different. Then you're sort of, you know, you go out to run an errand and you find yourself signing autographs, and that, of course, didn't happen before. My life has only changed in that, you know, when I go to a big convention for Twilight or if I go to a press junket or a press tour or whatever, then it is a bit more large scale than I'm used to. The massively enthused fan base that we have, it's like the ultimate driving force. Yes. It's very humbling to have someone want your autograph, you know, want a picture with you. Every time something happens, I try to think, well, you don't have it as bad as Rob. <laughs> we love <laughs> it sounds really boring, but people recognizing you as the most bizarre thing I've ever experienced. Rob is a and they kind of take on their, their appreciation of Edward and, you know, use that to, like, defend, like, my honor in, in reality, which is, like, kind of amazing. I love you, Edward! I love you! Will you marry me? Oh, that was my question! Yeah. Heck yes! <laughs> we have the best fans in the world. Fans that will stay out at midnight for a DVD release. You know, fans that go see the movie two, three, four, 11 times in some cases. And it's exciting to be able to give them something to get excited about, again. B marker, action. Happy birthday. Yeah, don't remind me. You know, it's a year later. It's nice to share stories of how we've all grown as individuals. For me, it's just the experience in general. Like, I was so excited to be back at Vamp Camp. <laughs> like, I was like with everybody. The gang's all here. Everybody's been off doing uh, adventurous things and, uh, and working other projects. So it's just really great to see the, uh, the family come back together. I can't even call it a family reunion because family reunions feel like, oh, you know, I haven't seen you in so long. I feel like I, it was just yesterday we were shooting. It does seem like deja vu in a way. Way. But the good thing about the cast is we're all really close, we all really get along. It's hard to find that, but we, we got lucky. And you know, as actors, it's kind of cool to start off already kind of comfortable with the whole thing. We're picking up where we left off. There's a flow. It, it feels very natural. At the end of the day, this all started with Stephanie. She created this world, and we all just feel incredibly grateful to be one of the pieces that's bringing it to visual life. When we were shooting the first one, that's what our goal was, to make a really good movie and have the fans want more. And they spoke up and, and here we are shooting number two. And now for New Moon, it's just, it's really exciting to be back with the team, be back with the cast, work with our new director, Chris Weitz, and be a part of something this crazy. Let's roll it. And action. I got a crazy, crazy idea. On the one hand, of course, it's exciting to take over a successful franchise. On the other hand, it's very daunting because there are so many fans who have high expectations for this film. Half of the time, I'm just overjoyed to be part of this. All right, let's just All right. do it. And the other half, I'm nervous that I'm going to be hunted down and killed.
by a pack of teenage girls <laughs> in about a year's time. But for me, the coolest thing is to work with this cast of extraordinarily talented people every day. Cut. That's a cut. How would I describe Chris? Well, he looks like a cross between a vampire and a werewolf to me. He's got the sort of chiseled look of a vampire, and he goes around talking in Italian and French and Spanish. Très simple. Action. El Saco. I did hear someone say the other day that he kind of wants to be British. <laughs> He's a man of the world, though, isn't he? He dresses warm every day, and he puts his socks over top of his pants, and he carries around a stick with him everywhere he goes. <laughs> he is a goofball. Well, to do what it takes, man. And yet he's all sort of like buff, like a werewolf, and kind of a bit hairy. <laughs> Probably did look a bit like a werewolf at the time. I just got too lazy to shave after a while. So he's uh, he's like a little mythological creature going around the place himself. Well, that's the first part. That's the exciting first part. <laughs> Chris is amazing. I really, really like Chris. He is on it. Chris Weiss is cool as ice. Chris is fantastic. Amazing. Great. Awesome. I think what sums it up is uh, a couple nights ago, under my door and under everybody's door, we got a packet. Which uh, I've now been warned I will be killed by ninjas if it is allowed to circulate on the internet. And I, I opened it up and, I, and it, was, it was a letter from Chris. It was like really long. He stayed up all night. He said he just started writing. Next thing you know, he's writing, 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 writing. Next thing you know, we have like a book like that. It was in great detail, and it was just telling us how excited he is to be here working with us, that this project is going to be a lot of fun, it's going to turn out amazing. That's a gift that Chris has. He's able to welcome everyone and set the scene, and through that, draw out these wonderful gems. OK, let's go on to the next scene. Check it. Thank you. Thank you. Lovely. I think that New Moon is going to be so fantastic. I think Twilight set up this great place for us, almost like a diving board. And now we're jumping off and going to a whole new level. My concern is with the emotions first and with Bella's emotions first, and that I'm not kind of some guy who's brought in to bring the nitro element to this series. It doesn't suddenly turn into an action movie. It's still about people, and it's about feelings. He wants to make it like the book, and he's very cool about that. It's on much more of a grand scale than anything we did in Twilight. It's all kind of so much more choreographed. It's very, very operatic. We get an opportunity to sort of expand our scope from the confines of Forks and the Forest to Italy, and so your sense of, of the mythology of this world is deepened. So there are a lot of surprises in store. It's a real pleasure working with Chris, it really is. He's one of the most compassionate human beings I've ever met. For this story, that you need that, and so he's perfect. He steps out here, Bella hits him, bang. Let's get everybody to come back. Here we go, man. I finish a set and everybody walks into the set and they say, oh, it's great, it's beautiful. Of course, that's nice. I don't really care about that. I certainly have gone ahead on this with some trepidation because it's a huge thing. All I care about is that the drama that the actors and the director are trying to assemble in front of the lens, that that is cradled in an environment that's perfect for what they're doing, for who their characters are, and for the story that's trying to be told. Everything beyond that, I'm just simply not interested. I'm lucky enough to, to have gotten David Brisman, who's an excellent production designer. The whole idea is to experience the full kind of range of emotional texture. On one hand, we had a certain advantage, and that is that a look had already been established. So what we wanted to do with Bella was just to show something that indicated a little bit more maturity on her part, because she was moving from grade 11 to grade 12. 
Chris is a different director. He was looking for a different palette world and a slightly different mood world. So Bella's nest that we were trying to achieve here had a little bit more warmth to it that existed as the location in Portland. So here we had to build the interior and the exterior. But there's this enormous sequence that involves Jacob sort of parkouring into her window. And it's one of the most important scenes between them in the movie. In the first house, if you look very, very carefully, there's a flicker of a moment when you can see actually that side of the house and there's no bay window there. So it was worth it to deviate from the old diagram to find the diagram that supported this little bit of storytelling. The Cullen's house was even trickier than Bella's. In the Cullen house, it was more like adding to an existing puzzle. In the first film, you actually do see the exterior fairly clearly. What we tried to do was bring that very specific palette of the exterior into the interior, and that was a way of knitting those pieces together. Primarily, Edward was dressed in a two-piece suit with a dark blue linen shirt. It took a lot of time to come up with the formula for creating that suit. I tried to find a fabric that wasn't contemporary, something that was interesting to look at because he was going to be wearing it all the time. We then followed a very contemporary cut for the suit, so we had his suits made for him. I just think it looks, it looks great. With Jacob's house, we found this fantastic location. Chris knew when he saw it that was the place he wanted to be Jacob's world. The fellow who owned the house built it when he was 17 as his sort of ideal cabin. Everything seemed perfect, but it was a greenhouse. It was really, really beautiful as a greenhouse. So I struggled with that, but there's a desire in the fan base to really keep the red of Jacob's house. So we photoshopped and looked at how it was in red, and it was still pretty wonderful. So we ended up painting the whole place red to match the book. When we were dressing the werewolves, what we wanted to do was to find something that made them look sexy. We knew that we had to put them in cutoffs, but it wasn't going to be short shorts. <laughs> Again, with him, we also wanted to show him moving from being a boy into a young man. So we shortened all of his shirts. We took in his tees to reflect the fact that he had these new great biceps. We try to maintain a coherence so that nothing seems unrealistic or bizarre. And when we go to Italy, the key is to cast it and to design it in such a way that it doesn't pop completely from the story, but it's still an integral and beautiful part of the whole thing. At the beginning, the numbers of extras that are going to be part of our massive Italian festival scene were to be determined. It started off as 350, then it grew to 400, and then someone asked me, well, how many do you really think you can do? Well, now it's 700. We came up with a simple formula that we thought would be almost like one size fits all. We also found an interesting shape that was a little bit more foreboding. So we're doing 20 of those. My assistant took samples to Italy and I leave on Thursday and hopefully I will see 700 <laughs> costumes ready for me. We were basically able in pre-production to make a tour of the 10 most gorgeous hill towns of Tuscany and Lombardy. The choice of Montepulciano as our Volterra was a sort of big discussion and we really worked on that to get it right. When we were going around and looking at towns, I was watching which things Chris would respond to. I could see what he was thinking in symmetrical terms. He was doing the Renaissance version as opposed to the sort of kind of used up realm of Gothic vampires. With the details on the interior of the hall, we ripped off shamelessly from quite known examples of Tuscan architecture. There's a lot of green and white marble used in various Tuscan cathedrals. The story posited an endless corridor, and because we now have CG technology and can actually create endless corridors without a lot of effort, I was intrigued by the idea of doing it within real architecture, where there's no question that there's actually architecture that the actors are moving through, so that where you begin, you cannot see the end. The key point that Chris wanted to impart was that the Volturi were very elegant. In the 21st century, we tried to make them as dark as possible, with the character Aro being the darkest of all, because he has the most power. In the 1790s, I did the reverse, and I tried to make Aro the lightest of possible, so that we could then see him at the top point of that triangular color palette. 
The idea of inscribing Latin in the hall was something that came from Chris. He just loves the idea of languages. So there were a few specific Latin sayings that he came up with and wanted us to include, but you know, we went to town. I sort of selected ones that seem particularly suitable. They do refer to this story. There's nothing in there that says, you know, give me all the money in the world or write a check to my father. One of them says the law above all things, and another says your death is my life, and another says life is short, art is long, which is kind of an interesting one in terms of making films because you know that when you make a film it's gonna knock around for a really long time. Ah, bing. Single. Him down to her. Single. This is actually Bella, believe it or not. Yeah, help her up. Ah, you're okay. No, now we're getting out to get out of the scene here. Let's get out. Up, 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 up you go. Up this you film go. has at its heart romance. The nice intersection between Stephanie Meyer's storytelling and Chris Weitz's directing had to do with finding the sort of aesthetic component to romance. I think we were pretty successful. You know that the film is probably going to live longer than you are, and in fact will achieve its own life. It's Taylor Lautner. We're in the rainy, cold Pacific Northwest, and it is the first day of filming of New Moon. You guys ready for rehearsal? Up. The whole motorcycle stuff is basically the development of Bella and Jacob's friendship. Really, it's Jacob kind of putting her back together in some way. Action! Where the hell have you been, Loka? Uh -huh. uh. He grows up overnight right in front of her in a time where she actually desperately needs a void to be filled. And yet, the sad thing about it is that even when Jacob is helping Bella pick up the pieces, as it were, it's sort of so that she can ride off and go see her vampire ex. Wow. OK. Um, they don't help you much. No, they do. Oh, yeah. I'm just actually kind of. That was an actor. <laughs> what are you really? <laughs> we begin to suspect that there's something odd going on with Jacob when he can very easily lift this motorcycle out of the truck. I suspect Taylor could have done it actually because he's made of muscle, but it's a very heavy piece of metal. You have to lift it on a kind of a winch system. It sounds very straightforward, right? But at the same time, you want to make it seem as though it were physically possible within a real world. <sighs> When did you get so strong? Takes multiple shots at it in order to make sure that it's not sort of floating up in the air away from his hands and doesn't look as though it's still attached to a pulley system. So that kind of stuff, although once it's finally done, looks like the easiest thing in the world to have done, is very uh, tedious and time consuming. Cut! Good. I think we got it. We started out with a bang and Bella delivered the motorcycles, so we'll catch with you later. Today's the big day, Bella. The Romeo and Juliet essay is due. Wherefore art thou, Bella? Today this is one of the earliest scenes in the movie. I, I believe this is the introduction of us little high school kids. Yeah. Bella just driving up and, you know, we're just goofing off. Like usual. <laughs> and then, you know, then the Collins come and, and then ruin our, oh. ruin our day. Yep. Yeah. We want to try and set up this specialized shot that I've wanted, which is through the viewfinder of the lens and then take it down, and then you see that they're set. Let's just give it a shot. We can do that. Yeah. We can do that. Happy picture. Cullen down. Oh, good. Cullen's here. 
Yay! See you later. Sweet ride, though. <laughs> Happy birthday. Yeah, don't remind me. <sighs> 18 is a little... <laughs> I'm sorry, yeah. I can't remember anything today. Let's do one more, if you're okay, we'll do one more for safety. All right, one more for safety. Thank you. Another guy, I don't have to use it. your birthday this weekend? It's my birthday right now. Today? Yeah, today. Yeah. Well, and it's Bella's birthday today, too, though, in the scene. It's both of their birthdays on the same day. We have a class. Hold on a second. Someone wants you. Happy birthday. I uh, saw this the other day. Thought of you. Catches bad dreams. Yeah. Very nice. Cut. I like it. I like it. We're checking. On Bella's birthday, she's becoming more and more aware of her own age and it's weighing on her very heavily. So she's not too excited to go to her birthday. It's the catalyst for her breakup and like her biggest nightmare, which is is Edward leaving her. Show me the love. It's a sort of ideal birthday party and in the minds of everyone involved. It's all beautifully decorated and everything and everyone's very happy and Edward's looking at her thinking she can become part of my family and my life and maybe this can work out. Of course, it kind of just inevitably falls to pieces. And jump backwards. Edward uh, is able to stop him, but uh, he comes back and keeps going, and it takes the, nearly the entire Cullen family to drag him down. <laughs> ah! A little bit of action, a little bit of ducking and jiving. <laughs> When Jasper is thrown and when she is thrown, if you look very carefully, you'll see that none of the people there are actually our first unit actors. Hi, my name's Crystal Dolman. I am the Bella's stunt double. And she goes flying backwards into the painting on the wall and the glass and all the flowers and all that stuff. Against this lovely table behind you, you decorated with a whole bunch of breakaway items. If you were to sneeze, they'd just shatter. Go! Now we're moving on to where Edward pushes Jasper backwards into the piano. So this is the piano. Some guy falls on top. We've got a breakaway lid, which is scored underneath to make it easy to break. This is just overhead shot for the confrontation going back. The ratchet system itself is, is combined of a pneumatic cylinder that we have mounted up in a special spot. Then we have cables that run to the guy, launching them about 15 feet backwards, about five feet in the air, and we land them precisely on a piano. Three, two, one. Okay, let's get ready. Rain up, please. Amusingly enough, it's raining today. It's been raining all day, but not enough rain to register on the camera. So even in British Columbia in the winter, you have to bring your own rain. Jake! Hey! What happens is Mother Nature's rain often looks really misty or foggy. And so when we bring in our own rain, we pound a lot of water up. For example, at some point today, our actress uh, was just getting deluged with rain. Did Sam get to you? Like, I'm drowning. Okay. Can we diminish the amount of rain coming from this thing here? Ah, ah. A little better. That's better. A little better. When I'm in this 38 degree weather, and I'm naked almost, and it's pouring rain on me, I can't seem like I'm cold. I can't be shivering, because Jacob's supposed to be just perfectly fine in it. OK, there's a bit of rain about to come. Watch out. 
Why so much rain today, one might ask. And I've been asking myself that as I've uh, watched my actors suffer all day and occasionally even been pelted myself. It's just one of those great romantic high tension scenes where the atmosphere builds to uh, support the emotions of the moment. I know that I've been hurting you. Just that I, I need you. You don't understand. So what might otherwise have been kind of just a, an argument between friends becomes this kind of very charged situation. Listen, you need to go home. And don't come back. We're going to get hurt. Hey guys, it's about 8 in the morning, and we're filming the scene where Jacob runs out of his house, jumps over the fence, jumps over the little creek, and uh, goes to protect Bella from Paul. He just transformed. Could we get a, a single on this? Let's go tighter, basically. Okay. Let him out sooner. Okay. B marker. Bella! Oh. <laughs> Nicely done. How, how are you holding up? Good. Sweet. We're one more of these. All right. It's really cool because uh, he's got a lot of talent that, that you just don't expect to see. When I first came in, they were telling me that he was going to do all of his own stuff, and I was going, yeah, sure, not likely. <laughs> and then Taylor was selling it way better than most guys would do. It was really nice. You getting a swelled head? Thank you, JJ. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm just worried about getting the Bella. I look as good as that. He was running quite fast there. I'm all wired up, actually. I got my harness on right now. Bella and Jacob are running towards each other. Bella thinks Jacob's gonna grab her, wrap her up in his arms, and, and Jacob's right over Three, top of her. Two, one. Ugh. <laughs> <laughs> I mean... There's wires, and they're hooked up to your hips, so it's all pulling just from the groin area. Um, so it's kind of dangerous, but in the moment, I'm not thinking about the danger involved. So I got so much adrenaline going that uh, it, it's quite a bit of fun. I get I get jolted up in the air 10 feet. I stop and have to freeze there. So then when it's all edited and put together, they're going to take my body and convert it into the wolf's body. Poof! It's really cool. The stunt work is one of my favorite parts. Don't be afraid. I'll make it quick. <laughs> We're out here in the middle of nowhere getting rained on as usual. We're shooting the scene where Bella tries to recapture the feeling that she had when she first fell in love with Edward by going to the meadow. Only uh, the meadow has become kind of a sad relic of its former days. And there she meets the vampire Laurent, who she thought was friendly to her and her cause, but who turns out to be something much more sinister. All of this is going to be seen in the next shot when we 360 around her. I wanted it to feel as though he was stalking her, swimming around her like a shark, basically. Do the Cullens visit often? Why? Uh, yeah, absolutely, all the time. So we made the decision to have a visual component to the hallucinations that, that Bella has in the book. We'd be shooting the actual scene, and I'd be there as a reference for um, Kristen. Then we reshot all of my stuff on uh, a kind of robotically controlled camera with a, a green screen later on. Rob, can we move you to your left by... Yeah, there we go. Perfect. So strangely, what you do is you're in the location, and then you put a green screen behind him, which takes away all evidence of the location that you're actually in. But what it does give you is the light that's falling on that particular moment of that particular day. These green screens are designed to be lit with ambient light. We're shooting in such a way that it's going to give us a lot of versatility later Hold when we do the effect in post. Three, and action. I tried not to do too much in the reference. I didn't want the apparitions to have uh, too much of a, an impact on the scene. It should. I was trying to make them all very subtle, so why? We didn't want him to look like a ghost in every other movie. We wanted to apply a very specific look, which was going to end up looking as though he were kind of a flickering candle flame or something like that. That was the metaphor that we were going with, that Bella was maintaining this kind of love for him in her heart. Cut, that's very nice. Good. <laughs> we like it.
and some walls. We had some cardboard, some styrofoam cutouts. The cardboard cutout that we use in the shots to lay out and block out the shots is so that the actors have some sort of reference as to what they're actually looking at. I don't believe it. And the best way to give an actor a sense of that is to show them previs, which is sort of an animated storyboard of what's going on in front of them. Can we step in the Wolfie McWolferson uh, wolf double? This is where we're going. <laughs> I haven't had to do too much acting to plastic wolf heads. I've done a lot to like scale it down and limit it to like only what I need to do. Like all the stuff where they're fighting and transforming and stuff like that. It's like five seconds of me reacting like, <gasps> and it's over. <laughs> really, the technology for giving people an idea of what they're interacting with has not moved forward for about 100 years, I think. Just for this, it's a, it's a, you know, a good striking post. Yeah. So to have Phil Tippett, Oscar winner, legend of the CGI world, running around with a styrofoam wolf head sort of doing a puppet show while, <laughs> while the shot's going on behind the camera, uh, which is kind of amusing. You hope to convey the seriousness of what's going on to the actors when everyone knows that behind the scenes there are wolves on sticks. They were very generous, generous actors, those plastic wolves. <laughs> Hi there, this is Iris. We are in New Moon. We shoot in this park in Coquitlam, but it happens to be there's snowing today, and I don't know how we're gonna fix that. Merry Christmas! <laughs> it's April 1st. I'm here with producer Wick Godfrey. It's <laughs> April 1st. Uh, and someone has played this prank where they just dumped snow on us. It's really funny. And there's Javier. <laughs> Javier, will this match yesterday? <laughs> Perfectly. <laughs> no problem. Yeah. No. It's a good. The DI they is say. perfect for me. Yes. This is what we have. Bella, now in the snowstorm. And uh, I thought I had seen everything, but this is, this is April 1st. April Fool's snowball. This is what we do when it's snowing. We go inside and we shoot on a green screen stage, which is a barn. Now no more snow problems. It's sort of like a, like a snow day at school. It's like, well, there's only so much we can do. And so we ended up going there to shoot all of the traveling shots in the cars, which end up looking as though you've shot them on location because then you map reflections onto the windows and all kinds of incredibly complicated stuff to make it look as though you hadn't shot it in a green screen stage in the first place. And action. If you had a normal boyfriend, he wouldn't have flung you into a table full of glass bowls. If I were a normal boyfriend, I wouldn't have to resist the urge to kill you. Stop. I don't want you to be normal. I want you. 108 degrees over here. It must be nice. Never getting cold. It's a wolf thing. It's not. It's a Jacob thing. Cut! Break! And slowly release the clutch. Ready? <laughs> Coquitlam. We're in Coquitlam right now. I'm loving the view here in the middle of the uh, mountains. And uh, we are filming the dirt bike scene. Bueno, pues puede decir, mira, todo el mundo puede ver. Everybody could see. Lo maravilloso que es esto, fíjate. How Cambia, cambia la cámara, is. mira. This one over there. Es impresionante. It's impressive. Es, impresionante. it's impressive. es para mí it's una me, enorme responsabilidad. A huge porque, responsibility. Porque tenemos que sacar because esto. Because we have to show con, this beautiful landscape. Con toda su belleza y With all its beauty. Todo su brillo. And all its shine. No, Canadá es incomparable. Oh, Canadá es incomparable. Está. No, no, I got it. <laughs> she comes to realize that any surge of adrenaline for whatever reason, ignites not only the subjective sort of image of him that she has, uh, like of his memory, but also she gets to hear his voice and what she would imagine that, that he would be telling her. Stop. Cut. Stand on the... All right. Yeah. <laughs> I just kept noticing how quickly my hand looked. 
<laughs> you stop me. Stop. 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 Kristen is now taking off on her dirt bike and she's about ready to go kill herself. Action. We were dragging Kristen very carefully on a special trailer that had space to mount cameras and monitors to tell how the action was going. Ah! She sees hallucinations of Edward. So all of the woods around were marked with fluorescent orange tape so that Kristen would have a reference to go to. We were able to get it in two takes, which is kind of miraculous. Yeah. It was cool to be on the back of a motorcycle on the back of a car. <laughs> we are on to the visual effects portion of this shot. Ready and action. It really is leading your hero actor up to a moment and stopping the second that things start to get dangerous or exciting and then calling for the stunts. What we're working on right now is Bella losing it on the bike. So the trick to this one here is that we don't want it to be a big gag trying to make sure that she lands before she gets to the rock and bounces instead of just hitting a rock with her head. Ready, and action! You okay? Guys, give her a big hand. <laughs> Let's check the gate on that. You know what? I actually get to ride the dirt bike. I, I don't need the rig. I get to ride the thing. <laughs> Something that was totally new was dirt bike riding. I'd never really done it before, so I had to go through a little bit of training. It's called faking like I know what to do with the dirt bike. I know nothing. I tried to look as comfortable and cool as possible on the bike. I got to zoom up and come to a skidding stop and throw the bike down. What, are you trying to get yourself killed? It was 38 degrees Fahrenheit, and I was shirtless. <laughs> but hey, I'm a werewolf. 108 degrees. Good morning. It's day 20, and things are just getting stranger. I'll be directing in a wetsuit. <laughs> in a gesture of complete futility, but uh, fellow feeling with the actors. That was fun. The water starts rushing in, so there's a long second of like. <laughs> we are shooting the elements of Bella having jumped off the cliff in the book and backing into a rock, which knocks her senseless for a bit. Ready? Here we go. To make the waves, we're using large bore pneumatic cylinders attached to paddles, which flap and push water, and they create about a one foot chop. I'm so bad with water, and that was what it would really feel like to be in a thrashing ocean. You have to be careful and like agile, oddly, even when you're trying to look reckless. How was it? Awesome. Yeah? Yeah. To create the rogue wave, we have a dump tank which is two sea cans on top of each other. We unload about 3,000 gallons of water in one shot. And it was like, here I am bobbing in the frame, and now I'm not. <laughs> Woo! Woo! And then I got really sick, <laughs> as you can probably hear in my voice. <laughs> Yeah, I like stunt work. Kind of scary, though. <laughs> We're finally uh, coming to basically the scene that kind of sets off the whole movie, which is really Edward breaking up with Bella. And it's a very emotional scene. Both actors have really prepared, and so you really want to give them the space and the time to do their best emotional work. We have to leave Forks. Why? Anybody who's ever been broken up with or had their heart stepped on, ripped out of them, you question everything that you have based your whole life on. It's like, is anything real? Because nothing could be more real than this, and now I'm wrong. You mean like I never existed? Don't. Bye. Great. Very nice. Cut.
thank you. We chose a wonderful location, which is very beautiful, but rather swampy, and a breeding ground for mosquitoes. I've never seen so many mosquitoes in my entire life, and giant ones as well. I could just tell when a mosquito just landed, like, on the end of my nose. Sucking blood from the apparently bloodless uh, Edward. And, like, Chris and I just look at her face and know it was there, and not be able to do anything about it, and they just did not stop landing on us. Not only were there mosquitoes, we were also near the flight path of a couple of flying schools. I'm coming. I don't know you're coming. Should we stop? Because that's a loud noise. So you're dealing not only with very intimate emotional content, but knowing that you might get a moment that will be spoiled either by a mosquito or by a plane flying by. It's very hard, and you want eventually not to be cobbling together a series of takes, but to, to really have something that feels like it's organic and true to the, to the moment in the book. <laughs> so actually, let's do that. <laughs> You know, it was like the most <laughs> traumatic scene in the whole thing. <laughs> I guess that wasn't my favorite scene to film. I wanted to have a fight sequence which wasn't as though we'd suddenly shift from this kind of very romantic film into an action movie. That it sort of made sense emotionally. It should really be more about Edward sacrificing himself and Bella being willing to die in his place. Shall we, Jay? Oh. Don't! Try it on me! There's a moment when I'm able to read all of Edward's thoughts and feelings that I get a hit of the intensity. Her blood appeals to you so much. How can you stand to be so close to her? That's the, the drive of this story, is that intensity. It should be more about that than about how cool the fight scene is. All right, here we go. Here we go. He doesn't have the hope in hell of, of, uh, of winning the fight. Mostly it's Edward getting the crap kicked out of him. Three, two, one, one and... You bring him up into the sitting position, then you drag him back and up. We're trying to rejig the style of the fighting on this show to give us something different. Final position. Sorry. Final position. Right. Collaboration-wise, I think what we all tended to do was we would go our own separate way for a little bit and think about how we should do it. JJ will essentially present um, ideas to me for different moves or incidents. Three, two, one, action. But also just his sort of eyeballing the set and thinking, well, what can I break here? And talking to David Brisbane about what can be made to be breakable and replaceable. That's when we got the really neat and creative moments. Let's roll camera. The trick to the fight is, is really in the time. We're shooting it at 96 frames per second, also shooting Bella's reactions at 96 frames per second. So we have both the human perspective on the fight and the vampire perspective on the fight. Mostly it's about trying to keep everything big and flowing and open so that when we speed up, it looks good. It was fun though, I mean, it looks cool. so kind to us. Everyone is a bit stir crazy, but uh, and I couldn't be happier with the footage we're getting. So things are good. We are uh, towards the end of the movie. Jacob's coming back to beg Great. Bella to not allow her to go to Italy. So uh, here we go. Let's go get the job done. 
there's a moment of near a near miss between uh, Jacob and Bella. Yeah. All right, here we go. Last shot in Vancouver. And action. Yes, we do. Bella. Coke loudly. Swan residence. He's not here right now. He's arranging a funeral. Cut. Good. We are cut. Check in the gate. Check in the gate. Waiting for the clear gate. Waiting for the clear gate. It's clean. Well, oh. that is a camera wrap. That's a camera wrap, everybody. Yes, yes. yes. Camera wrap. Thank you very much, everyone. Bella, he's going to Italy, to the Volturi. That is a camera wrap. That's a camera wrap, everybody. Yes! Yes! Camera wrap, thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. We're done shooting. We are in the editorial process. And now we are looking at visual effects as they're slotted in. Post-production. <laughs> Post production, and we don't have enough time for it, but we got along really well, just had great communication. Collaboration wise, I think what we all tended to do was we would go our own separate way for a little bit and think about how we should do it, and then we would all come together with our over the top suggestions and try to make it work for the other guy, and that's when we got the really neat creative moments. We are shooting the green screen element of Victoria diving, escaping the wolves into the water. We're doing what they call Russian swing. We've got the stunt woman up there swinging, diving into an airbag. Look, my stunt double, Atlan, made me a t-shirt that says Team Victoria. How awesome is that? Atlan is our stunt double for Rochelle. This is her first show. She's a Cirque du Soleil performer that wanted to become a stunt performer. And uh, she's been just phenomenal. Well, I've actually been surprised at, at how much action there was. As soon as we started putting things together and creating, it just seemed like there were plenty of opportunities. So we ended up doing a lot more and, 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 and really pumping up the action on this show. Today, we're at Vancouver Film Studios, shooting an element for the cliff diving sequence. This was always going to be the most logistically complicated thing to do in terms of putting together the final shots. It involves CG water, no easy task. We have the actual cliff called Parthenon, which second unit shot with doubles. You have the edge of the cliff, which is actually Capilano Dam in North Vancouver. We have a stunt woman who jumps into an inflatable green bag from a great height. My name is Loralee Connery. I'm a stunt woman. I'm here today to do a 70 foot high fall. And um, 70 feet is pretty high. <laughs> When we shoot a stunt like this, we always want to look out for safety first. Three, two, one, go! She is free falling. She's got no wires on her. And the camera connected to it are winch lines. And that's operated by controls that we'll have by the monitor. It'll look like the camera is dropping as fast as she is. No camera! So you're talking about six or seven different elements that are combined to make one seamless shot. I like it. 
We check it. We were faced with the need to match certain locations which had originally been shot in Portland. And there are two ways that you can do that. One is you just rebuild something, which is what we did with Bella's house. We built the exterior of Bella's house on an actual patch of land outside of Vancouver, which looked enough like the place established in the first movie. But if you look inside, it's largely just kind of um, raw lumber. And then the interiors are actually done on stage. Or you can do a matte painting composed of uh, digital stills. We shot a, an entire scene in a parking lot, which was meant to be the parking lot of the high school, which was used in the first film. Jake. Hello, biceps. We're at a parking lot in Vancouver that is going to be Forks High School. And so um, wherever you see green there, that's going to be replaced with the high school. There are extras walking to nowhere, and um, then you composite in the stills, which have then been turned into a 3D model of the architecture of the school. Uh, and so when it actually comes down to it, you can even see students entering the school, and there's pretty much no way to tell the difference. The vampire skin effect, that's the big one for us. Well, Edward has so-called diamond skin, and the idea is that he's made of, as all vampires are, made of sort of a, a sparkly marble. It's a difficult effect because, first of all, Rob is pretty easy to look at to begin with, and as soon as you start messing with his face, you can very easily get into a point where it's not beautiful, where in fact it looks like a skin problem. We were trying to make it look as if there was something kind of underneath the skin that is actually reflecting this instead of this being just slapped on top. We looked at a piece of marble, which is a kind of marble that you might even use in kitchen countertops, and when you turn it in the light, each of these facets will catch the light and, and shine it for a very brief moment, so it creates a sparkly effect. So we were trying to sort of imitate the look and feel of that kind of marble. Action. And we'll actually shoot Rob in the environment, but we'll put a lot of tracking dots on his face and chest and hands wherever we see his skin in the sunlight. And we've scanned his face and body. So we built a 3D version of him, basically. I got to stare at lots of Edward reference for a while. I might be the envy of, of some people for that. And uh, basically, we created a 3D version of him, tracked all the shots where he had diamond skin, and then our effects artist did effects on the 3D geometry, and we just put it on top of him. It's a very delicate balance of finding something that gets the feeling that Stephanie described of diamonds, you know, glistening in the sun. You will feel nothing. I don't believe it. We also helped establish some of the vampire speed look. Vampire Speed was kind of a, a weird fluke. Uh, they shot the shots at varying speeds and not really sure, I think, at the time they were shooting how we're, it was going to get treated in the end. We submitted at one point a um, daily with a, a broken uh, comp on it where there was some weird smudging and blurring and the director kind of latched onto that and liked that look. And when we went to try to reproduce it, it was a, a busted script and we couldn't reproduce it. So we had to launch back into kind of trying to recreate this look. And we ended up with something a little bit different, but that's kind of was the genesis of it. For the wolves, you try to deliver a character who can um, express uh, emotions without it being sort of cartoony. And that's what Tippett's people are great at. The material calls for these things not to be like histronic or hyperactive act classical monster movie werewolves. They have to behave, you know, like real wolves in the field, except they're three or four times the size of normal wolves. Our job is to basically climb inside the skin and find out what it is to be a wolf. The pre-work started with actually going out and trying to find some real wolves that we could uh, get some good solid reference off of. These are the timber wolves that we basically got to hang out with, and you don't quite get their scale until you're standing next to them, and they are really foreboding characters. You could really see the dynamic, and you had the alpha that was very personable and kind of the ambassador, and then you had the beta that was like a little more mischievous. You couldn't turn your back on that one and take your hat or your cell phone or whatever. And then the third one was always a little bit skittish. That was really interesting, that just purely animal dynamic. As they are personifying the minds of the human characters, these things actually have to impart what 
the actors, what we're bringing to the roles as well. They're built from the inside out, so basically a skeletal system, you know, is, is created that has, you know, moving joints uh, that can be animated. And on top of that, there's muscles that can flex and skin, layer of skin, and then fur. Each wolf has a set of these features that we've built into it to individualize them. We went through several iterations of kind of scaling different features, making some ears more pointy, longer, shorter, uh, snout longer, shorter. I think there's a balance between getting caught up in the minutia and trying to get the character right. And there were a lot of parts, like there's a different fur type all over a wolf, from his mane to his tail to his back to his flank. And that's actually was one of the more satisfying parts of this picture for me, was watching our engineers work with our artists to kind of get our um, fur tool to do what it needed. It was a really wonderful collaboration. Each of the scenes was significantly different, so it's taking all of this technology and you know, work on it until you, you get what you need to do the job. One of the um, kind of thrills for us is when it's finally released to get that response, it's always a little bit of a surprise. We want the work to look great. We want everybody to, to love the work, and they weren't ever drawn out of the movie because visual effects or whatever. Visual effects are not like about being flashy or saying this shot is cool for the sake of being cool. It's, it's very much about getting the story across. Uh, it's great that we can give them something, you know, a little bit of entertainment in between, but this is a movie about the interrelationship between the three lead actors. I firmly believe that less is more, <laughs> you know, that you want to leave the audience wanting. And if you get the right shots with the right choreography, uh, the scenes fill themselves out and they feel bigger, you know, in, in the mind and you just don't sit. <laughs> okay, stop it, turn it off, I want to go home. I just have enjoyed the whole process. I've had more fun doing this than anything that I've done in recent memory. So, yeah, it's just been exciting and I hope that people love it. I belong with you. No. You don't. I'm coming. Bella. I don't want you to come. Bella. <laughs> I don't want you to come. Bella, I don't want you to come. Bella, I don't want you to come with me. I'm Peter Lambert and I'm the editor of the film. I've been working on the film since six weeks before shooting. I talked with Chris about ideas about how transitions might work from one scene to another. I cut uh, storyboards together to see what they'd actually look like and played them with music and sometimes bits of dialogue or subtitles. Then through shooting I was working the whole time in order to have a working version of the film by the end of the shoot. Every scene in the movie uh, will be shot from a variety of angles numerous times and our job in editing is uh, by cutting from these shots regularly uh, to construct a scene where uh, every moment is played out in the most dynamic or emotional or funny or moving way possible and uh, which is most befitting for where that scene fits within the whole movie. Bella? Bella? <laughs> Bella, I don't want you to come. Quite often, uh, we make a decision that the way it was played out in the first place uh, isn't the best way to do it. Um, or the way we originally imagined it and the way we originally edited it, we'll get an idea and think about maybe trying to change it. There's a moment in the film, uh, towards the end of the movie, when Arrow, the head of the Volturi, is about to kill Bella. Uh, and in the original version of the scene, he moves his hand into uh, what we call the kind of high-five karate death chop uh, in order to kill her. But fairly recently, after actually discussion with Stephanie, about that moment, a couple of ideas came up. One was that it would be very cool if, um, when Arrow says the line, If only it were your intention to give her immortality. We should have like a beat where Edward is almost given the opportunity to say, I will make her immortal. So it's like an offer that just hangs there. But the other thing was, uh, we kind of thought that maybe the high five karate death chop wasn't uh, the most scary way of 
playing that moment, uh, and that it, you know, we didn't want it to look in any way kind of pantomime-like. Um, so we, through stealing parts from uh, different parts of the dailies, uh, we can construct a different, a different way of playing it out. Something more like this. Wait! Bella will be one of us. I've seen it. We began with a three-hour assembly of the film, and a lot just went out, just through cutting out the, the unnecessary uh, be sort of more lingering, breathy beats. The other thing that happened is that uh, we we find scenes that not only we think are unnecessary, but very often we feel are actually distracting or, or going against the way the overall story is working. And we now have a fine final cut, which is just over two hours. Uh, the date of the release of the film has been on our minds from before shooting, which has been incredibly exciting. We've wanted to show little examples uh, of what we're doing to fans throughout the shoot and throughout uh, post-production and that's meant that we've had to be turning over sequences for visual effects from a very early stage. When a big visual effects sequence or a big set piece is shot it comes to me with just very basic elements and generally uh, in the case for example of a wolf fight that will be a series of shots of just empty fields or meadows and it's our job in the first stages of editing to construct sequences and to use our imaginations basically in order to work out what might be going on within those shots. We've tried to be uh, pretty faithful to the book. That's been Chris's maxim the whole way through. So our hope is that if people like the book a little bit, they'll like New Moon a little bit. And I think people hopefully will appreciate that shots which could have been held 12 frames too long have been cut in exactly the right moments. At the same time you're editing together the movie and you're uh, working on the music and you are uh, working on the sound effects and um, all kinds of other processes are going on. We're getting score from Alexandre Desplat, who is posting um, temporary score to us and emailing him back, uh, getting it back and forth with him about how the score is going to fit in to its different spots. Tycoos, just Timp. Alexander, our composer, made a temporary version of tracks which will eventually be recorded, and Chris will go to London uh, to the recording to be there for that. We've got the London Symphony Orchestra playing for us one of the greatest orchestras in the world, so the, the amazing thing is how quickly they, they get it. There's a lot of uh, minutes to record, 80 minutes of music. Sometimes when we, you watch a film you don't realize that there's so much music going on behind the dialogues and the action, but it's a, a huge part of the post-production moment. The idea was to have it all be through the main character, Bella's uh, point of view, so that no matter what theme was playing, they all kind of locked into one another. Now, from 56 onwards, the piano will be a leader. We just uh, recorded the final scene when Bella says uh, goodbye to Jacob and uh, Edward offers to marry her. So it's, it's quite a big scene. Music is it's another actor. My main goal is always to bring to the audience what is not on screen. I think the subtext, the, the, non, the unspoken, is more important in the music because only the music can bring that in a in very subtle way and subliminal way to the ears and to the heart of the audience. Once we've got this, uh, we have all of our kind of contemporary, um, you know, pop or rock or whatever you want to call it, indie uh, tracks that are also going to go into the film. Uh, and I go back to uh, Los Angeles, finish coloring the film, which is, a, you know, I'm doing digital intermediate, so that we're doing sort of the same thing with the colors of the film that we're doing here with the music of it. Okay, well, let's see the top again. We're taking everything into a digital atmosphere, and we're manipulating pixels. With our modern technology, we can dynamically affect different parts of the image. We can change the color of backgrounds, we can make a forest more green. There's really not much of a limit to, to what we can do when we've got a good colorist. And then two or three weeks of, of mixing all the sounds together so that the score fits in with 
the dialogue and the Foley artists work to, you know, make the opening of doors and footsteps and all that kind of stuff, and just to make sure that everything works harmoniously. Go home and don't come back, or you're going to get hurt. I hope that audiences will love New Moon if they're familiar with the books, because it delivers um, what the book does to them, and that it's a, a kind of a, a vision of of the book that satisfies them as a reader with action and romance and all kinds of good stuff that people used to go to the movies for. But that's for them to say, not me, I think. It was a uh, fantastic experience for me making it. I learned a lot.